Amen, amen, amen. Our God is wonderful. Let us pray. Wonderful God, ever-present God, filling this space right now with your love, your hope, your joy, filling each of us with that too. May we feel it, may we live it, both here and elsewhere on our journey, and may we share it here and everywhere that we go and live. May we hear you, God, now as we know you're here. May I hear you so that I can say something that might help all of us hear you in some other or new way. And may we all know that we're blessed by the word, the presence, the hope, and love of God. In all your names, amen. Well, I'm really glad and grateful and blessed to be with you today, standing up here doing this, although I wish the circumstances were quite different. You see, I have learned so much in my four years or so at MCCDC from the spiritual teaching of Pastor Duane, new perspectives, new wisdom from this wise and good holy man. I know that you feel that way too, I'm sure many of you. And I know you join me in prayers for his full recovery and return to us. And as we've already experienced in worship this morning, and Reverend Kathy talked a little bit about it near the beginning, we're doing things a little differently, you might say out of order or even upside down in Lent this year, right? On Sunday today, huh? But the deliberate upending of the way we usually do things is, I believe, precisely what the entry into Jerusalem by Jesus riding the donkey, what that's all about. It was indeed an interruption, indeed a disruption, a challenge to how things are usually done. Eminent biblical scholars, Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan, call the entrance into Jerusalem a deliberate challenge to the domination system enforced by the Roman overlords like Pilate, and how that system even involved the Jewish authorities who cooperated, or at least acquiesced. These scholars tell us that there was indeed a counter-procession that day one in which the Roman legions, you know, got big horses and men on there with breastplates and all sorts of fancy looking stuff and everything like that, full regalia, led by Pilate and all his generals, entered the city, something they did each year at the time of the Hebrew holy days. Now, I'm going to call that Pilate parade, that Roman parade, the glory parade because they were all out for the glory for them and their empire. And it was done each year at this time, not because the authorities revered or even respected Hebrew faith, but because at this time of year, those same authorities feared trouble, concerned that the natives, the natives, would get uh, riled up, remembering that Passover is the great celebration of the Jewish and the Hebrew people being freed from an earlier despotism in Egypt. That's Passover, is right there, is that whole celebration of God getting him out of Egypt. This show of force by Rome was to make the, local, the locals afraid to act up. Some of us know a little bit about acting up sometimes, right? We know Dr. King, for an example, greatly aided by a hero of mine, Bayard Rustin, planned and pulled together the 1963 March on Washington for Civil Rights for Black Americans. I mention that because Jesus did the same thing in Jerusalem for the oppressed of Israel. All the ordinary Hebrew people who struggled against political oppression from Rome, the power of, of the few to have most of the wealth and indeed the involvement of their religious leaders in condoning that system. 
I want to take a moment here just to say a word about this coming Saturday, March 7th. It's the 55th anniversary of Bloody Sunday on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. And that was, of course, by some marchers who were intending to go from Selma to Montgomery to agitate for voting rights. And they were beaten and bloodied. That is what the Roman legions were there to do, should they need to, should things get out of hand. And that probably might have been more than just beating and bloodiness. They probably would have killed a bunch of people in the process. So that's what that's going on. Those are the two processions, if you will, that are going on in Jerusalem. So I think this makes Jesus march. I'm calling it a march. Yes, it was a triumphal entry on that donkey and so on and so forth, and people cheered and so on. But I think of it as a march. That triumphal entry, of course, was the lovely picture of a grown man riding on a donkey and the adoration of the populace. And it could be like a rock star almost, you know? Uh, or maybe the ticker tape parade for the World Series winners or the troops when they come home from a, from a battle, from a war. So that's, that's what we often think of, of course, but that's... The Romans had a different idea about what that meant. And they were not happy. And just like the struggle for rights of African Americans and Native Americans and women and LGBT people and poor, differently able Americans, there's a long history, a long history that predates the marches, campaigns, agitations that continue in our own day. You might call it a marathon. Now our first reading from Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 to 10, tells us more of the history than Matthew quotes in the Gospel passage today. He does quote the Quran, but he only, he only does part of it. This prophet shared the ancient Hebrew teaching that the new ruler of God's people would change everything. That ruler, we might even say even the Messiah, would end the tyranny they endured free them from bondage, but also would come in peace, become, coming to end war, to make the nations live in peace and harmony. And that ruler would reign over and with everyone, for everyone, for the well-being of all and for all time. You might almost say it's like, the, like a counter- empire to Rome. It's the empire of, the, of all for all. Everybody, everybody is welcome and blessed and so on. So, you know, that's about as clear a challenge to Rome, Pilate and the boys, and their religious enablers as you can get. That was a pretty direct challenge. And Jesus led it. Jesus inspired it. He even organized it. You know that? You realize that? That's what that means when he sends those disciples. He's organizing this thing to happen at a particular time. So for a brief time that day in Jerusalem, Israel, people felt a moment of liberation. We're shown a glimpse of what could be, indeed what ought to be, what God wanted then and wants now. An end to violence and war, an end to violation of people's divinely ordered humanity through economic and other forms of oppression and injustice, and an end to the acquiescence in that system of domination by religious leaders and others. No wonder Jesus is on that cross five days later. That's what they knew was intended as authorities, and they didn't want to have that get out of hand. So where does that leave us today? Well, I'm reminded that the march for this kind of world of peace and plenty and dignity for all is ongoing. Going back to the agitation by Moses and God for the liberation of the Hebrews in Egypt. But it never ends, my friends. And we have roles to play, as we've already had a little bit in our worship so far, and some of our singing and so on. We have roles to play. We have a place to be, each, in us, each of us in our own way. But one thing for me is certain. 
one thing I know for myself, I have to show up. I have to be part of the march. I have to be part of the endless marathon. Now, we have used the word passion a lot this morning, and we'll continue to do so all the way to Easter this year. But what is clear to me is that the passion of Jesus, the passion of Christ, is not limited to what happened to him on the cross. Now, that's what I grew up with. That was the passion of Christ, was that after that three hours in the afternoon, Jesus was on there and he died. And that was the passion. And of course, we know what happens afterward, thank goodness. But um, it's not limited to that. That's in my view. The passion of Jesus. Not, again, I don't want to just downplay that, but the passion of Jesus, the passion of the one we call Christ, marks his life, marks every moment in Jesus' life. He had passion for people. He had pa and all kinds of people, right? He had passion for truth. He had passion for prayer. He had passion to tell the truth himself and to get others to face it and tell it themselves. He had passion for God. His passion was fun, full display on Good Friday, no doubt about that, and at the march into Jerusalem a few days earlier. But it animated and drove him every day of his life. I know if I call myself a follower of Jesus, I am called to live such passion in my own day and in my own ways. Every day, all my days, always imbued with the passion of Jesus, peace and love of God. So what about you? Will you allow that passion to help you show up for the march? Will your passion help you continue and even grow your own marathon? And what passion is calling you today? What passion animates your soul enough to get out of your comfort zone? I'm saying these questions to myself, by the way, as well. To do something that interrupts, disrupts, challenges the things that drag you down, hold you down, that drag others down, that hold others down. What are some ways we might do that? I have a few thoughts about that. And the first one is, we need to face what needs changing. Another of my heroes and guides, James Baldwin, said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed unless it is faced. So what do you need to face? What do I need to face? Lent is a good time to think about that, to pray about it, to let yourself feel the passion of God, the passion of Jesus, to ask for divine help in discerning what are the things in your life, in our life together as a faith community, our life as people in, in and of this world, what are the things that need to change? And as we heard a little earlier, where do you feel you should enter or must enter the story? What drives you to show up like Jesus did, like Jesus shows us how to do? Like Jesus, I believe, I know, is still calling me. Well, here are a couple of ideas. And this is only a very incomplete list, but these are the things that occurred to me with God's help as I was thinking about this today. One, listen more not only to those in your family and circle of friends, but also to those in other circumstances. And of course, to God, to Jesus, as, as you take time every day to meditate and or pray. One of the things I, I want to go back to listen more, because I keep learning that my prayer time is not just about me telling God what's what. It's about me shutting up and listening, waiting for that. And I get it when I do. Oh my God, it's so real. So pay attention to what God you know, is telling you and so on and so forth. And make a, chase, a choice to follow up as you feel called. Two, like Jesus, don't be afraid to cross boundaries. 
in our starkly divided nation and world right now, it is imperative, imperative that we connect with those whose lives, whose opinions, whose priorities differ from ours. You know, I, I have a couple of examples I'm going to say very quickly, but there was a suburban hockey mom in Maryland, actually. It was in the Post the other day. And her son played hockey, of course, in the school, and he had a, a black teammate, friend, dear friend. And that black team, this isn't something that just happened 50 years ago or 20 years ago. This just happened recently, last year, who was really badly damaged by the racist taunts and words that came at him as he was playing a game of hockey. So what did she do? This wasn't even her son. This was the friend of her son. She started a campaign um, to, against racist violence in hockey. I didn't know this, but hockey apparently has not only kids' hockey, but also professional hockey has a fair amount of racists going on. So, and she's joined now with, uh, this was in Maryland, but now she's got a national thing going, and she's joined with the father of that boy who was taunted and hurt uh, to create um, a whole national movement. The other one is, just so you know, you know, we're going through this kind of time in Afghan Afghanistan right now, where they're to put their arms down and the Taliban and uh, we're going to hopefully have some peace, right? Well, it's very shaky yet. But there were Afghan soldiers who in this week of this reduced tension between the government and the Taliban, the U.S. and the Taliban, they invited Taliban soldiers on the other side of their position. In other words, these Two groups are out here, and the, the Afghani troops said, come have lunch with us. Come have lunch with us. Talk about crossing a boundary. It's a dangerous boundary to cross, actually, because it could have, who knows what might have happened. Well, anyway, so you get the point. Don't be afraid to cross boundaries. And then enlarge your generosity to support causes that touch and ignite your passion, to share resources with others in need. And I'm, again, saying this to myself. An example is carrying extra change or dollar bills or protein bars to give to homeless people you encounter on the street. Or volunteer at a homeless shelter or help the sanctuary for undocumented persons. All sorts, I mean, there's so much we could be about, right? And we can't begin to match the extravagance of God's generosity each and every day in each of our lives and in the world. But we can maybe get a little closer of that truth in our own lives. Four, join in a march or two or three here in D.C. Many of you have probably done that. I certainly have. For causes about which you feel passionately. But, you know, there's going to be more. It's always more, right? Remember that Jesus was and is passionate about justice and peace. Five, change something in your worship life, whether it means being more regularly in church on Sunday or joining a ministry. By the way, I'm looking for Lenten devotionals from anybody who'd like to write one. Maybe it's a way of changing the way you participate in worship. You know, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and I did my training in Episcopal Seminary and so on and so forth. And it was pretty, pretty organized and clear. You did this at this moment and this at this moment, and everything was read from the book. And, you know, if you, and nobody said a word that wasn't in the prayer book and so on and so forth. And the idea that somebody might get up and say, well, hallelujah! Or, amen, brother! Or, preach it! The idea, I mean, that would have, people would have stopped and said, I, they would have expected a lightning bolt to come down and strike us all dead, right? So I've learned over the years in MCC, certainly in this one and other ones as well, that when musicians sing, and Deidre plays, and Daniel plays, and whatever, you know, it's okay for me to wave my arms and say yes, and I, uh, and it stand up sometimes, right? Yeah, what a sense of freedom that is in some very important ways. On the other hand, some of us come from other traditions, where that's the norm, right? Yes, 
Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Stand up. Dance around. Whatever. And that's good, too. There's nothing wrong with either one of these things. But I might suggest to you, just as a little exercise, maybe if that's your tradition, and you usually do it, maybe take a Sunday and just sit and kind of listen and feel. Let it come inside you rather than you know, necessarily engaging it in other ways. Just a thought. As I said, all those things are good. I'm not, there's no one thing that's better than the other. Finally, speak, in, speak up. Speak up. In your home. I don't know about your home, but my home. We have some things that sometimes I need to say. Right? Sometimes I don't find it as easy to do as others, but it's important because then my husband and I have a chance to work something out. With your family at work, in the public square, wherever your voice is needed to care for yourself, speak up for yourself, to care for others, speak up for others, to care for the world. As another of my heroes and guides, the Afro-Caribbean lesbian feminist poet, essayist Audre Lorde wrote a long time ago now, when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. So in other words, my friends, show up, stand up, be a beacon, be a witness, join the march of Jesus, the marathon of God. Join and sing with your whole spirit and your whole body the triumph song of life. Amen.